Aloha. Welcome to Talk Story with John Waihe. I have a very interesting show for all of you today. As my guest, I have my fame leader, Jay Fidel. He's here. Now, I've got to give you the backstory to today's, uh, to today's program. And that is that Jay was sitting there at lunch one day, quietly eating his sandwich, I believe it was, and I happened to walk by and ended up being a guest on his show. And Jay has this passion right now for talking about our current so-called president, uh, President Trump. And I ended up being on his show, and I thought, I would love to carry that conversation on further at, uh, today on my show. Now, when we, when we were together the last time, we talked about uh, Donald Trump and the use of executive orders. Now, that's been a while, around for a while, Jay. So there's been some reaction to those executive orders. Um, so what's your fre favorite president up to now? I heard he just got overruled by the, the uh, yeah. United States Supreme Court. Oh. You know that? No. Yeah. Well, he, no, no, not the Supreme you mean Court. The Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit. Yeah. The Ninth Circuit. With uh, our own Judge Clifton. Right. Uh, in that panel, three man panel. Yeah. Wasn't that something? It was incredible. You know, I thought, was, and, and it was a great uh, Twitter exchange, as there is whenever the, uh, the president does something, you know. And he immediately tweeted something about so called judges, you know, see you in court or something. Yeah. You know? yeah. And the governor of Washington state tweeted us back and he said, you just did and you lost. <laughs> That's great. great I thought idea. I thought that that would make you happy. It you does. Know? <laughs> <laughs> well, today's subject is politics of the absurd, or something like that, which is uh, made a lot of people think that's where we are today. Yeah. That things are going badly now. Give me a grade. A, B, C, D, D minus. How is our president doing? Oh, F. Sorry. Really? F. Not even, and why? why? Not even a D minus. Uh, because he's, A, he's, uh, you know, he's separating himself from the public, um, from those in government who might serve him. I mean, he's even alienating his own bureaucracy. That's clear. He's alienated the press. He's alienated foreign leaders. He's alienated business. Uh, I, I can't think of anyone he hasn't alienated, except maybe some of the constituents who voted for him in the red states. But but most Steve people... Steve Bannon has an alien yeah, Steve oh, Bannon. Oh, yeah, yeah, but I don't think that matters. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The guy, you know, the guy's pretty, uh, pretty close to him, and he wrote a lot of articles about how we ought to be friends with Russia and do all of this stuff, and <laughs> seems to be well-received at dinners. It all seems so absurd, John. It totally does, doesn't absurd. it? I mean, this is the kind of politics we're talking about. Is there's an absurdity to it? Uh, but you know, it's interesting to me that people who speak for him, that go to his defense, many, many of who those talking heads that we see on the media and so forth, are actually paid for by the Trump organization somehow. And, but they're up there talking about the biggest defense of this president is that he's carrying out his campaign promises. Now, and people say, yeah, okay, he is. So what, what is he or, or what? Uh, Oh, I, I suppose he? you could say that some of the things he said, which were outrageous to start with, he's attempting to carry on um, in, a, in a completely klutzy way. I mean, you don't have to do klutzy things. You could do more sophisticated things. You could back off on some promises that were outrageous. But I think he sees this as um, a... Uh, um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, that that he that he made these promises, and that when they voted for him, they gave him authority. No, they uh, gave him a mandate. A mandate. Some kind. They gave him a mandate to do what he promised, and and that mandate concept he has is really troublesome because then he gets to interpret what the promise was, and as we know, he changes about things, and sometimes he doesn't well, he tell the truth. Well, he seems like he constantly lies. That too. 
In fact, I, but I, I saw one of the, um, like a, a guest editorialist, I guess it was, who said that all presidents lie. All presidents lie. Uh, even if you say that's true. Right. Th that it is true in politics. This is special, what's happening here. So, I, I you know, I, I think that uh, all presidents may have lied, but occasionally some of them tell the truth. <laughs> And I can't remember, you know, what the truth is that he, uh, this president, talked talk, talk about. Well, I, think, I think he brings with him the same things that he showed us in the, uh, in the campaign. And I think we, if we had to think about it, we would not have voted for him, any of us. Um, and the people who, you know, we have people here in the studio who say some, oh, we ask them, what do you think about how Trump is doing this? He's doing great. He's doing exactly what I would want him to do. But I think that's weakening. That's softening, and there are fewer people that, uh, who are well, saying Well, there, there are days. people who, who are saying that, which I think underscores the point of this particular program, and that is um, is politics becoming absurd. Are, are we entering an era where this president is really manifestation of what's going on in general? I mean, why aren't, uh, where are the, in, on the Republican side of the fence, where are the Everett Dirksons? Where are the, the great Republican leaders who here. would stand for their country now, first? hopefully they will surface. Hopefully they will come out. Hopefully the Republican Party will see better of it, and those who have been following Trump mindlessly will start to do a little thought about it and change their way of dealing. Maybe even Paul Ryan. Uh, if, th if that happens, we're going to see a whole change in the way this administration is operating. Well, hopefully. Hopefully, because somebody needs to stand up. I mean, okay, what, what he did that might have been, might have been a little bit better than an F in terms of keeping his promises, was he immediately went after the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. With mistake, TPB. mistake, yeah. mistake. And which, by the way, was actually formulated as a kind of a conservative uh, program. And all kinds of ripple effects. That's the interesting thing. To go back to the point which we were discussing before the show, you know, that Donald Trump is ignorant. He, he, his education is not up to the job, not even close. Okay. But, but he may think it is. It's not. Um, and so it reminds me of all the anti-lawyering jokes that we've heard, anti-lawyer jokes we've heard over our over lifetimes. Our lifetimes you know, yeah. Over yeah. our lifetime. It you came know, with it, my degree. <laughs> you know, uh, people. But the fact is <clears throat> that <clears throat> in, in, a, in an office where you need to enforce laws, make laws, appreciate laws, retain the Constitution in some semblance of order, a lawyer has an advantage. A lawyer understands these things, understands the Constitution, and checks and balances, balance of power and all that, understands the way Congress, the president, executive. I mean, he really he took the position in the Ninth Circuit case. His, his attorney general, who presumably did go to law school, but works for a guy who didn't, right. said that the, that the federal courts do not have the power to review the actions of the president. That's really poppycock. <laughs> How could they have said that? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it just uh, it just creates a different kind of environment. I mean, people are doing things and saying things that just don't make any, any kind so of sense. This is a nation of laws. Right. Uh, and it's really important. I mean, more than any other country on earth, this is a nation of laws and precedent, the rule of law. And here's a president who doesn't have a clue about the rule of law. Well, this is very scary, John. And, and even I'm, there's, there are reports that his own Supreme Court nominee, who is no liberal by any stretch of the imagination, even his own Supreme Court nominee has told the various senators that he does not appreciate uh, President Trump's attack on the judiciary. Now, Trump called that poppycock and all of this stuff, but uh, apparently he said it. Um, and <laughs> it's wonderful, <laughs> which is a good thing. But it shows that even those people who may, on various policies, be in sync with some of the things that uh, Trump has proposed, 
realize that what he's doing is not necessarily policy driven, but actually destroying the institutional fabrics of our democracy. You yeah. know? Back to the point about the mandate. So I believe that Trump thinks that by being elected, he can do any bloody thing he wants. And it's personal. It's a personal presidency. Whatever he wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning with, he can do that. And he has the power, and there's a lot of power, the power of the presidency to do whatever strikes him. And this is a real problem. Well, I, I'm going to take that problem farther, maybe even take it to its absurd conclusion. But recently, I've been rereading some history books that, that you know, I, I, I love history, so I've been rereading reading some of that. And there are parallels that that I find fascinating with our current state of affairs. And that is starting off with the, the Roman Republic, which was a republic. And then it became kind of an oligarchy where you had, they, they actually called them plebeians, which were the poor people, uh, poor citizens, and patricians, which were the rich people, and blah, 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 and how that all evolved over time and how various patricians, rich people, would end up heroes of the rest of the thing and become tyrants, eventually evolving into emperors. Now, that's also, by the way, if you want a really ugly example, uh, how Adolf Hitler got to be uh, where he was in, mm -hmm. in Germany, that mm -hmm. same kind of process. And I just wonder whether or not, whether it's intentional or not, whether America would be maybe slipping into that same kind of uh, situation. Well, a lot of people, people feel that way, John. I mean, that, that it is happening, that it is slipping, and that he is a haunting a similarity to Hitler um, because uh, he's not into the rule of law. He's into a personal presidency, and he uses these, he uses divisive techniques to divide us. And, and we are being divided, and there are, there are unpleasant uh, confrontations happening now, and, I, and I'll bet you five that next six months we'll see a lot more of that. We will probably see violence. Uh, in the country, and I put it right at his doorstep. He has created this environment with his style. Um, it's very regrettable, and I think he uses it to accede to more power. I mean, you know, it's the old thing about just spell my name right. Well, he has a, the first 20 articles in the New York Times every day and in most other publications every day. There's hardly room for anything else. Um, he's doing The Apprentice in spades now. He's seeking be the best mm -hmm. ratings possible, occupying everybody's uh, attention all day long. You know what's so funny was that he doesn't seem to be able to rein his ego in. Because, you know, he, he has refused to uh, give up his, uh, I guess, his relationship to the TV show The Apprenticeship. Or at yeah, least, he, yeah, as yeah. far as I know, he has yeah. it, right? Putting down Arnold Schwarzenegger. But then he you puts know, down ridiculous. Schwarzenegger. Yeah. He can't have Schwarzenegger be popular. Right. So he keeps his own show to criticize it, to say that I'm better than this new guy. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I don't know. I, I You know, I, I took a freshman course in psychology, but uh, somebody out there that's, that's done more studies than I have got, must recognize something about all of this. You know, we've seen a lot of bashing in the newspapers, and certainly the New York Times is no slouch on that. They, they have something, you know, every day, more than once. Um, but one article that really struck me was Maureen Dowd. Uh, she's one of those uh, op-ed writers uh, in the New York Times, and her piece was, thank you, thank you, Mr. Trump. You're doing a great job by, by activating people who up to this point were not active. By having people come out and express their views about the government and about issues and about your presidency, who before would not have done that. Um, it's sort of making uh, America a great democracy again. I mean, I, she used a term like that. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because here's our president and even the, le the leaders, the leader of Hamas, 
which is a, one of these terrorist organizations, you know? I mean, these are not good people. Hamas calls him a clown. Now, how much respect do you have when you go around the world doing things like he did with the Australian prime minister and he cuts them off? That's our number one ally. So the big thing is to try to figure out what the jury is. And I think more people are going to call him a clown. I think there'll be more nasty articles about him criticizing everything he does looking at every movie makes um, at the, but the question in my mind John and I wonder what your thought is about this is are the public is the public going to get tired of this well I hope so we're, we're going to go to a commercial at this time and we'll be right back with this most interesting conversation about politics and of the absurd <laughs> Thank you for watching Think Tech, Planet of the Courageous. I'm Dr. Dean Nelson, host of Planet of the Courageous. In Tibetan mythology, it's said that you pick this planet to learn something. You picked your birth on this planet to learn something. This planet is spinning and hurling through space at 67,000 miles per hour, and it takes courage to not slip into fear and collapse into anxiety. One can find so many justifications for selfishness and prejudice. But we have two ears to listen to one another and one heart that can provide a common ground. But this takes courage to stay in that space. We've chosen the right planet for the opportunity to learn courage and try to solve so many challenges. Aloha. Thank you for watching. You're watching ThinkTech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe'i and with our guest, my boss in a way, Jay <laughs> Fidel, who, as you know, uh, has this passion for talking about the current state of national politics under the, our, our, our president. And we have been just discussing various absurdities of the situation. But, and, 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 uh, and I want to ask you, uh, to invite you actually, to ask me questions. And by the way, folks, if you want to call in, our number is 415-871-2474. But meanwhile, you'll get a chance to do some cross-examination. But I do have a question for you, and that is whether or not instead of creating a, a revitalization of our politics, you know, as suggested by the writer of the Washington Post. Maureen Dowd, yeah. that article, huh? Yeah. Right. What if this becomes the new normal? What if people start to expect that you can do things? That you can, I mean, look at, look at this presidency. He refuses to release his uh, uh, business information and tax returns, so we don't have any real idea what his financial uh, holdings are. His, uh, his daughter, who is in a business, uh, gets uh, re replaced because she, her goods are not selling as much as it should. And he tweets that that was an unjust decision. This is a president of the United States now <laughs> tweeting to an American business that you got to buy her goods almost, you know? And, and you keep going on and on. I mean, look at the fact that we are talking about his constant lying instead of judging. What he did, the one thing he did as commander in chief that actually re, re, uh, used those powers by approving an excur uh, a military operation in Yemen where children were killed and American lives were lost and where the country itself said, don't ever come back into our country anymore. I mean, this is the guy's first test. That's a definite F. Yeah. But he did it, by the way, without any uh, briefings. He, he did it with sitting around a dinner table chatting with his boys. Gunslinger. You know, and then boom, boom, people die. And he comes back and he said, that's a victory. I mean, and then he calls John McCain 
uh, you know, whatever you think of his politics, and I, he, he is still an American hero. And he calls him a loser because McCain says that was wrong. You never do that with a military operation. This is our president. Yeah. You know, so is this going to be the new normal? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Well, I think things are dynamic, and they're always changing, and they're changing now because he's very disruptive. Um, and he's, you know, he's ignorant. He doesn't understand the law or his role. He's shooting from the hip on everything. And if you ask me the trajectory about whether this becomes a new normal, I'd say only for a short time because it can't be the new normal. It, we can't, it's not sustainable, right? Unless we end up like Rome did and like Germany. Yeah. With which is means you enforce it as the new normal. You actually know a lie is a lie, and you just enforce it as the truth. Big question, yeah. And so the Times is trying to hold his feet to the fire. A good part of the American press is trying to hold his feet to the This is a test. The courts, as the Ninth Circuit, trying to hold his feet to the fire. And the question is whether this will continue, whether they will continue to hold his feet to well, the fire. Well, how do you hold somebody's feet to the fire where he directly threatens you as a United States citizen? He doesn't, you know, he starts off by saying the media is against us, you know, or as Banyan said, the media is the opposition. Well, they're supposed to be the opposition. That's what you, 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 you have. That's their estate, right? But then this guy will tweet about you personally. You know, Winning even by intimidation. Right. And at, at which point do you have people start to cave? I think we're treating them with kid gloves now. I agree. You know? This is relatively speaking a honeymoon. Yeah. Relatively speaking. But, you know, I think there are were, there were processes there. One is his credibility is, is being, you know, undermined. Because the press is going to continue, at least for a while, to, to knock him off the pedestal. And we will, we will hear about the lies. I mean, it, it really interests me. The New York Times writes an article and they say, they don't say Donald Trump said. They say Donald Trump falsely said. They tell you right up front that well, they can say a I lie. And I think that's the, our salvation. This is going to be one time when maybe Jeff Portnoy, this the lawyer for the uh, for, for the for the newspapers, and we actually we we will be in sync yeah. because our salvation, in my opinion, is the strength of the press, where they keep doing that despite this direct personal intimidation. I have talked to business people that that have told me that they won't challenge him because they're afraid of a tax audit. And they should be. No, no, they never, were they actually threatened? No, they just have this uh, ambient. Look, look what he did with the, 600 people were arrested by immigration officials in the last and week. Sent, yeah. And, and are in jail, waiting deportation. I mean, he's following through on that, some of that stuff, and it's awful. And there are people, by the way, who, uh, I, I, I find hope in, with the press, personally. I find hope with those that uh, protest, all these marches and things. And I find uh, the hope, the glimmer of this, is that the country will rise up and, and, and reject it. But the other side of this is that a lot of people uh, may start to uh, copy this kind of behavior, kind of bullying behavior. I agree. That's happening. Yeah. I mean, people, ordinary people, they take the negative, the negative atmosphere and, and do the same kinds of things themselves. Uh, they go into uh, racial prejudice. Uh, uh, they're, they're really nasty well, to there people. There are more they, racial instances yes. in the, since he became president yes. than ever before. Yes. What do you do when you tell, you know, police, for example, that have a tough enough job as it is, but they know? that there are some rogues within their own ranks, and all of a sudden it seems like the rogues are being called heroes. What do you do to the honest guy? 
what does he do? You know, he, does he go along to get along or, or what, you know? Well, with all the confluence of all these different sea changes, the sea changes that, you know, he's going to continue to do it, maybe in a more sophisticated way, like we expected another executive order today, maybe that, that happened or will happen, uh, one that will cure the problems, you know, purportedly cure the problems in the last executive order on immigration. Um, we have people who may get tired of protest. You can't keep on doing that on a sustainable basis. Right, right. We get the press, and maybe the press gets intimidated. Maybe some of the press fades from their campaigns well, against Well, some him. of the people start to copy his behavior, too. And some of the people, you know, all these vectors, and they're all dynamic, they're all changing. It's sort of a, a porridge of change, a soup of change. So I do have a question for you. Okay. I have two questions. When you put it all together... They put it all, honestly, from all of these various factors, uh, including international ones, where are we going on this? Are, are we going to be okay? Are we going to be okay? This is like the line from I, the marathon man. I, is it I, safe? I, I, I am extremely worried. I, first of all, I'm extremely worried, and yet I have great hope for, for, uh, for, our, for our country. And I'm extremely worried because, for example, and I will give you a specific example. For example, his constant attacks on the uh, independent judiciary, you know, so-called judges. This judge can't decide my case because he's Mexican-American. Mexican, judge, American. American. Mexican judge. And then now the attacks on the Ninth Circuit. There is even a bill being introduced, <laughs> and it's not the, on its own merits, and there may be some, maybe this is something that needs to be done, but it's been introduced in the context of the President Trump's reaction to the Ninth Circuit, reintroduced to uh, divide the circuit up, to split it all up. Punitive. Yeah. Now, at the Hawaii State Legislature, at the Hawaii State Legislature, we, now, take a look at the effect of Donald Trump's actions, maybe, on whether consciously or unconsciously, on the effect on our own political system here. Now, this is a state that voted 67% for his opponent, has a, re, has a Democratic Senate that uh, has no Republicans in it, uh, you know, a state that you would think if anybody would be standing up for an independent judiciary in these times, it ought to be Hawaii. Yet, what are our legislators actually doing? They're taking a page from this month's absurdity, this monstrosity, and bringing it to Hawaii. Now, there may be merits on what they're doing. But they cannot deny that the motivation for what is going on is punitive. And as a result of their dissatisfaction with the, with the holdings, the decisions of an independent judiciary, the legislature is proposing, for example, a constitutional amendment to have, make sure that politicians get to check your judges right after they make decisions. Now, for confirmation, number one, they are pay, hearing bills that are threatening the pensions of judges. Now, you cannot tell me that somebody sitting on the bench, knowing that his decision may affect whether or not he's going to be able to send his kids to college, won't at least have a moment of thought. You see, so it's not this pervasiveness that I'm talking about is not just for the Republican states. What is it doing to us? It's infectious. It's infectious. Now, I'm hoping that sanity grabs all of this. And Hope that so. as a result of people marching, talking, and, uh, and, and you know, saying, no, 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 not me, um, some of this will change. But that's to be seen. You know?